This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. surge of willingness today on the part of many European nations to send peacekeeping troops to Lebanon. United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan is in Brussels for an emergency meeting of European Union foreign ministers. RBA's Dennis Zinn has the story. Contingent of French soldiers landed at Nakura in southern Lebanon this morning, just hours after French President Jacques Chirac pledged to increase his country's contribution to the United Nations peacekeeping force from an already announced 400 troops to 2,000. Speaking to reporters in Paris, Chirac said France hopes to retain command of the international mission. Chirac and German Chancellor Angela Merkel were marking the anniversary of the liberation of the French capital on the 25th of August 1944. The French troops that landed today are part of an engineering battalion. We are landing 170 uh, men plus all their equipment and that is a uh, heavy load. Uh, they are coming with the bulldozers, they are coming with trucks and all the necessary equipment to rebuild and also uh, do some uh, depollution and uh, neutralization of uh, ordnance, unexploded ordnance. Also this morning, European foreign ministers began arriving in Belgium to attend the EU Foreign Ministers Council on the UN force in Lebanon. The UN is appealing for further contributions of soldiers from member countries to add to those of France, Italy, Spain, Finland, Denmark, Germany, Greece and Belgium. Israel rejected offers from Malaysia, Bangladesh and Indonesia, all Muslim countries that do not recognize the Jewish state. During a meeting with UN Secretary General Kofi Annan this morning, Belgian Prime Minister Guy Verhofstadt said Brussels has decided to announce what he called a substantial contribution of peacekeepers to the international force. With the hope that we uh, leave Brussels with uh, a large number of soldiers and I'm confident Belgium will play its part. Moscow has not yet pledged any forces to Lebanon. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Ivanov said it was still too early for this decision as it is still unclear what the peacekeepers will do there. He rejected Israeli claims that Hezbollah is using modern Russian weapons, saying people should not confuse Russia with the former Soviet Union. Meanwhile, life for residents of the north of Israel is slowly returning to normal, although their concerns over a renewal of cross-border fighting remains high. News of the possible arrival of an expanded UN peacekeeping force in the area has done little to allay their fears. The Europeans are somehow trying to run away from this agreement that they themselves made and I'm not sure what's going to happen. I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think we in, we in the North anyway are pretty scared of the whole situation. I don't think it's going to be stable for any length of time. I'm not sure that the Europeans will want their uh, troops to fight the Hezbollah because I think they actually are are afraid of losing uh, troops' lives. Israel is expected to withdraw the last of its troops from Lebanon when the bulk of the expanded UN force is in place. Dennis Zinn, ABA News. Foreign Minister Tsipi Livni says that the IDF will withdraw from southern Lebanon once the international force deploys across the country together with the Lebanese army. However, Israel will pull out only after an arms embargo is imposed on Hezbollah as demanded in United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701. Livni met this morning in Jerusalem with Greek Foreign Minister Theodora Bakoyanis. Livni responded to Syrian objections to the presence of UNIFIL forces near its border with Lebanon to prevent arms smuggling. The foreign minister said, the time has come for Syria to give Lebanon the freedom and ability to be an independent and sovereign nation. 
I believe that this is about time that the international community uh, decides and starts in the implementation of uh, uh, the Security Council decision. Um, I think that there is a chance for a change in Lebanon. I believe that the Israeli interest and the Lebanese interest and the international community interest are the same interests. And uh, I believe that there is, this is a moment of opportunity to change the situation in the region, but it depends, of course, not only on Israel, it depends mainly on the Lebanese government and in the international community's determination. It's about time, time that Syria gives Lebanon the freedom and the ability to be independent and sovereign state. The resolution 1701 is uh, maybe not the perfect resolution, but it is the first step for a long-standing peace in the area. So we need to implement it on, from, on every side. Israeli protests against Prime Minister Ehud Olmert increased due to his handling of the war against Hezbollah. Hundreds of reservists who participated in the military operation in Lebanon gathered in West Jerusalem along with families of those who died during the war demanding Olmert's resignation. The protesters marched to the grave of former Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir carrying a sign that read, Olmert resigned. These protests came after an opinion poll revealed that most Israelis support the resignation of Olmert, Minister of Defense Amir Peretz, and Military Chief of Staff General Dan Halutz after the failures in the war in Lebanon. Weekly newspapers in Israel expressed the wide sentiment of the Israeli street. They were full of questions and discussions of the aftermath of the war on Lebanon, as well as the political situation in Israel. Two main headlines dominated the first page of Yedeot Anna newspaper, one about the scandal of Israeli President Katsaf, and the second an opinion poll showing that 63% of Israelis want Prime Minister Olmert to resign, while 74% demanded Amir Perez's resignation. The poll also showed that support for the Nukadima party has diminished, while support for the Likud party increased by 20 seats. Ma'arev newspaper focused on the Syrian issue, while Haratz was more interested in the deployment of the International Peacekeeping Force and the results of Levni's meeting with the Italian foreign minister. Omer did not handle or prepare for the war properly. He wants to be a successor to Sharon, but he will not succeed. The Prime Minister and the Minister of Defense should not be attacked like this. The confrontation hasn't ended yet. We should wait until the end of the investigations. This is also my opinion with regard to the president's issue. I think the administration is setting a bad example by acting in this manner. They should set a good example for the public. Israeli newspapers also focused on sharp criticism of Olmert's government and its handling of Israel's longest war. In light of the scandals that are following the government, the presidency and the army in Israel, it is likely that these voices will only get louder. It appears that the main beneficiary of the intensification of the political crisis in Israel is Benjamin Netanyahu, who became the alternative for Israelis after they lost all confidence in the current leadership and due to the lack of other alternatives on the Israeli political scene. Rima Mustafa Al Arabiya, West Jerusalem. Rima Mustafa Al Arabiya, Al Quds Al Gharbiya.
ذكرت صحيفة نيويورك تايمز على موقعها في شبكة الإنترنت إن According to the New York Times website, the U.S. has opened an investigation into Israel's use of American-made cluster bombs and whether the use of these weapons in its war on Lebanon violated secret agreements with Washington. According to the Times, the investigation was opened based on information indicating that Israel used anti-personnel munitions and that the remains of these kinds of bombs were found in hundreds of different locations in southern Lebanon. It looks like a black small ball, so if you are one of the southern Lebanese returning to your homes, be careful not to stumble on one of them. And advise your children to stay away from any black balls because just even a slight kick is sufficient to blow it up. These bombs have killed at least three civilians and injured tens of others in their homes and farms since the ceasefire. These balls are part of the cluster bombs. The Israeli use of these banned weapons in Lebanon generated an international controversy. The UN Mine Action Coordination Center has found remnants of these bombs in 285 locations. According to the UN, the search operations are still ongoing. Both the UN and the US have opened an investigation into the Israeli use of these kinds of American-made cluster bombs. They are investigating whether Israel's use of these bombs violated secret agreements with Washington, and if Israel should be punished if found in violation of these agreements. The Human Rights Watch confirmed that Israel has used these kinds of weapons and said that the Geneva Convention allows for the use of these weapons but not against residential areas because these bombs are dispersed across large areas. One cluster bomb contains tens or hundreds of small bombs. Once in the air, these bombs explode, spreading to more than tens of meters in radius. These bombs are used when targets can't be specified, killing people and posing future threats to the survivors. The margin of error in the use of Israeli cluster bombs is 14 percent. Israel has defended what it describes as its right to use these cluster bombs, claiming that it use of these bombs did not violate international law. However, Israel did not say whether it used them in the war in Lebanon. Also, Israel said that it will not face any problems with Washington because the agreements they reached in the 70s allows for the use of these bombs against regular Arab armies and military targets. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad said that calls for redrawing Lebanese borders and the Shiba farms are an Israeli-sponsored resolution. Al-Assad stressed that the victory of the resistance in Lebanon proves that the Arab world has chosen to be on the path of resistance. The Syrian President Bashar al-Assad described the historical achievement of the resistance in Lebanon as a 100% Lebanese victory. He added that the Arab world, including Syria, has the right to learn lessons from this great experience. During a televised interview with Dubai Satellite Network, Al-Assad stressed that only the resistance decides whether to accept or reject moral or financial support from any Arab state. He said that the resistance carried the burden of the war and it should be allowed to reap the benefits of the victory. He added that the U.S. played a part in the Israeli aggression in Lebanon and that Israel sponsored a U.N. resolution calling for the redrawing of the southern borders. The Lebanese were the ones who fought the Israeli enemy, and Lebanon was the one paying the ultimate price. The majority of the world watched the war on television screens. The Arab states ought to be happy for the victory of the Lebanese resistance, and they should learn valuable lessons from it. However, only Lebanon could claim the victory of the resistance and reap its benefits. Israel is mounting pressure on the international community to redraw the Lebanese borders at the Shabaab farms. And the reason is clear, which is to eradicate the Lebanese resistance. Syria opposes such a plan until all Israeli forces pull out from the Shabaab farms. During his last visit to Lebanon, my foreign minister informed the Lebanese government of our decision. This topic is not up for discussion. Al-Assad also commented on the deployment of international forces along the Lebanese-Syrian borders.
Deploying international troops on the Lebanese-Syrian borders will create animosity between the two countries. First and foremost, the deployment undermines the Lebanese sovereignty. No country accepts the deployment of foreign troops along its national borders unless it is engaged in a war, such as the case in southern Lebanon and the Golan Heights. Once again, the deployment will undermine Lebanese sovereignty by putting it in the hands of foreign troops. Second, this resolution contains an anti-Syrian sentiment, and it will cause problems between Damascus and Beirut. We urge the Lebanese government to assume responsibility. The choice is theirs. If they want to damage their relationship with Syria, then they are free to do so. In fact, there is a group within the Lebanese government trying to do just that. Al-Assad also said that Israel tried to drag Syria into war, but the steadfastness of the resistance had taught Tel Aviv an unforgettable lesson. Hezbollah's victory was sufficient enough to teach Israel a valuable lesson. As I said earlier, when an army goes into the battlefield, it must have a clear mission. Otherwise, if there is no clear mission, the army will not be as effective. The war is not a case of an action to a reaction. In a previous speech, Al-Assad described some Lebanese government officials of being the outcome of an Israeli manufacturing facility. Al-Assad said that his previous comments do not apply to the majority of the Lebanese officials, but to a specific group within the government. In my speech, I was referring to a specific group in the Lebanese government, especially those officials who maintained historical relationships with Israel. Moreover, some Lebanese officials indirectly support Israel. For example, they supported the Israeli-sponsored Resolution 1559. Also, they support UN Resolution 1680, which targets the Syrian-Lebanese relationship. Does Resolution 1680 serve Lebanese or Syrian interests? Of course not. It serves Israeli interests. Now the war on Lebanon has exposed these positions. Therefore, it has become imperative to talk openly. Al-Assad said that the disagreement among the Arabs and the lack of the presence on the political and international spectrum helped pave the way to the Israeli-American aggression in Lebanon. The French President Jacques Chirac tried to stop the war in Lebanon on the third day when he met with President George Bush in Petersburg. He told him, let us have a ceasefire and put pressure on Israel, otherwise Lebanon would be destroyed. Bush, however, told Chirac, give us only 10 days so the Israelis can finish the job. He thought that Israel would be able to finish the job in 10 days. But after 10 days, Bush did not take a moderate stand. Bush continued his hardline policy and refused to make any contact with Syria or Iran, ignoring gestures made by the Syrian ambassador about his country's willingness to intervene. The Syrians said that their intervention would be effective in ending the war, but George Bush refused because he was convinced that this war was caused by Syria and Iran. Bush believed that Hezbollah was being used to achieve the interests of the two countries. He did not want to allow them to play a role in ending the war. This leads me to believe that the war is now run by extremists. Look at Lebanon, for example. The role of moderates like Parliament Speaker Nabih Berri is marginalized. <laughs> Does this mean that a future confrontation between U.S. and Iran is almost certain? Yes, but the United States cannot act despite its great anger towards Iran because of the Russian and Chinese positions. They are very influential countries. Would Russia and China tolerate a nuclear Iran? Can Russia and China live with this? China has no objections. First of all, if Iran would acquire a nuclear bomb, it would challenge the United States. 
The Chinese want to challenge the United States through another country. Nowadays, the concept of war by proxies is on the rise. Some are fighting the wars of others. Second, Iran has gas and oil deals with China and India, and it is not concerned with possible economic sanctions that the United States may bring about. The United States cannot do much because even if sanctions were imposed, they would not be effective. Third, the Russians seem to believe that if Iran would acquire a nuclear bomb, that would make the Middle East conflict easier to resolve. If Iran were to become nuclear, Israel would be forced to reconsider its policies. This is exactly what happened with the Kashmiri problem between India and Pakistan. After Pakistan acquired its nuclear bomb, the Kashmiri peace process improved a lot. The Pakistani nuclear bomb created a balance of terror. The status quo changed when one country was no longer more powerful than the other. Israel has 100 to 200 nuclear warheads. If Iran were to acquire a nuclear bomb, this may help in resolving the Middle East conflict. Iran wants to get the credit for resolving the Middle East conflict so it can take all the prestige. Iran can then say, all of you Arabs could not solve the Palestinian problem, but I, Iran, was able to do so. Two Palestinians were martyred early this morning and seven others were wounded in two separate operations carried out by the Israeli forces during a raid in Han Yunus in the southern Gaza Strip. The Israeli forces arrested more than 20 Palestinians as they combed and raided houses in the towns of Kalkila and Azum. In another development, the Jerusalem Brigades, the military wing of the Islamic Jihad movement, announced that it fired a rocket on the town of Majdal in response to the Israeli attacks. The Israeli forces were here in Abbasan. They hit this house, causing extensive damage. One person was martyred and four others were wounded, but this wasn't enough. The Israeli forces did not leave until they arrested the martyr's brother, a Hamas leader. This woman started ululating to express how she felt as she said goodbye to the martyr. These young men chose to smudge their faces and clothes with the blood of the martyr, perhaps as a sign of pride that one of their comrades died as a martyr and that they intend to avenge his death. The Farhin town near the Gaza-Israeli border also had its share of missile strikes. An Israeli tank fired a shell at a gathering of Palestinians, martyring an Islamic Jihad member and wounding three others. Israel claimed that they were trying to cross illegally into Israel. The escalating situation in Gaza is moving side by side with the voices calling for the release of the American and New Zealander journalists held by a Palestinian movement that now calls itself the Holy Jihad. Brigades. They do not represent Islamic Jihad. They might be a fictitious organization or a new one, but it's not Islamic Jihad. However, we are following this news. What's important to us is the release of the two journalists and their safe return back to their families. The repeated calls for the release of the two journalists came after the kidnappers gave Washington 72 hours to release all Muslim prisoners in the United States. We in the Hamas movement have no information on the group that calls itself the Holy Jihad. But in any case, we in Hamas refuse and condemn the kidnapping of foreign journalists. We demand kidnappers to immediately release these two journalists. 
We also stress the necessity of releasing Palestine prisoners and all political prisoners of whether in Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib. However, it does not appear that the United States will yield to the kidnappers' demands. The U.S. called for the release of the two journalists immediately and without condition. Meanwhile, New Zealand dispatched a police officer to Gaza to support the negotiation efforts for the release of the kidnapped journalists. How does this crisis look if you live in Beirut or Bethlehem, Gaza or Haifa? Join us for this Mosaic Intelligence Report only on Link TV. Almost two weeks have passed since a ceasefire was declared between Israel and Hezbollah. However, the Israeli siege on Lebanon has not ended and Hezbollah has not been disarmed, causing anticipation in the region that another round of hostilities may be imminent. In the aftermath of this 33-day brutal war, a debate has risen both on Lebanon and Israel. On Arab TV, the definition of the sovereignty of the state is being argued with many wondering when Hezbollah's role of a state within a state would end. Lebanese sovereignty, or the sovereignty of any country in international law, means that the state is the only body with the right to use force on its territories. In Lebanon's case, it became apparent to us that it is very weak as a state and that the right to use force is not confined to the state. There is a party that may even be stronger than the state, and it has given itself the right to use weapons and declare war and peace. So the war showed us that Lebanon is a weak state and there is a party that is stronger than the state. All the hostilities between certain segments of the Lebanese society and the Syrian regime renewed verbally, at least for the time being. Deploying international troops on the Lebanese-Syrian borders will create animosity between the two countries. First and foremost, the deployment undermines the Lebanese sovereignty. No country accepts the deployment of foreign troops along its national borders unless it is engaged in a war, such as the case in southern Lebanon and the Golan Heights. You only acknowledge the country's sovereignty when it's convenient for you, and when it's not, you don't. Perhaps we will be able to rebuild, thanks to the generous donations of Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and other Arab Gulf states, as well as with Egyptian and Jordanian support. So yes, we will rebuild. Meanwhile, calls for the resignation of Israeli Prime Minister Olmert have been on the rise. The Israeli press has been describing him as a dead man walking. The Israeli government, starting from its president, has been marred with scandals and controversies, and the Israeli media has been having a field day in covering this issue. Question that there should be uh, a very, uh, a very deep and focused uh, inquiry uh, with the uh, following priorities: first of all, to prepare the army as fast as possible. Uh, for the next round, which is uh, seem to be inevitable. While both Israel and Hezbollah had rushed in claiming victory in the war in Lebanon, many analysts see that only Iran has been victorious. They say that Iran has now established itself as a regional power in the Middle East, competing with the United States for dominance. At the same time, it has been able to survive all international pressures that wants it to end its nuclear enrichment program. Many analysts expect that if sanctions were to be imposed on Iran, nothing would change and Iran would prevail because its trade is secure with countries like Russia and China, both opposing sanctions or military intervention in Iran. I'm Jamal Dejani for Mosaic Intelligence Report. To read different opinions about the Middle East or add your own, visit our website at linktv.org slash mirblog. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. Please visit linktv.org backslash mosaic for more information about these broadcasters or to view previous mosaic programs, obtain program transcripts, or receive the weekly mosaic intelligence report.
Mosaic is made possible by a grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Additional support is provided by the Firedall Foundation, the Otto Haas Charitable Trust, and by committed Link TV viewers like you. If you value this program, please send your tax-deductible contribution to Link TV, either through the website or the mailing address listed on your screen. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.